In May of 2001, a truck driver named Raymond, who had been stationed in San Antonio, encountered two significantly unsettling encounters along the I-35 North with an entity that he struggled to articulate. It was a time period before smartphones were commonplace and navigation was mostly just through traditional paper map. After a long, tiring day of work in the corporate world, this seemingly ordinary trip turned out to be an unprecedented adventure. Late into this particular evening, something he will never be able to forget had transpired. An unknown creature, unlike any animal he had ever seen, streaked across the highway. The creature reminded him a bit like a wild boar and a dog, shaggy and hunched over, and notably more substantial than the size of a regular dog. It seemed as if he had just walked into a scene from a tacky sci-fi flick. The creature darted across the road effortlessly and then climbed up an almost vertical embankment before disappearing into oblivion. Incredulous at his own sighting, he had barely enough time to register the creature darting across the highway. He was able to observe it for several long seconds before it vanished, leaving him in disbelief. He knew it was not a coyote or any ordinary creature. Despite his best efforts to attribute this vision to fatigue and exhaustion, another, much more horrifying encounter occurred about five weeks after. In early June 2001, Raymond found himself driving home from a friend's house late in the evening while off work. The time was around 11.15 p.m., and he was navigating his way along Farm to Market Road, located right in Vanderpool, Texas. His car radio was on, providing some distraction as he reflected on the events of his day. Suddenly, in a metaphorical bolt of lightning, everything in his vehicle ceases to function. His engine, radio, everything experienced a sudden cessation of activity which forced him to maneuver his vehicle off the road. Following this occurrence, Raymond gets out of his truck, armed with a flashlight, and proceeded to examine under the hood of his car. However, even with the very thorough search, the source of the sudden failure of his truck proved elusive. This is the moment where he starts to feel a strange sensation surrounding him. He likens it to an imminent thunderstorm advancing rapidly, even though the night is crystal clear. Quite quickly, he seems to be immersed in an itinerant electric current, and within moments, the rustling of leaves and the foliage on the sides of the road becomes loud. This is the moment Raymond's survival instincts kick into action, alerting him to the apparent danger looming. He isn't questioning who or what is causing this yet, but he is certain that his immediate action should be to distance himself from here. With this in mind, he urgently sprints back to his truck, slams the door shut, and as this man retrieves his Colt 45 from his glove compartment, his truck miraculously comes back to life after several attempts. The side road noises grew louder every passing second. The 30 or so it took him to re-enter his truck, draw his revolver, and ignite the engine. Now, just as his truck roared into existence, his headlights illuminated the figure emerging from the foliage onto the road. The sight mirrored the creature he had encountered during his first nocturnal journey up I-35 North. However, this entity was noticeably larger, appeared more aggressive, and boasted more grotesque features. The size of its canines were alarming, dwarfing those of any normal creature. And disturbingly, it seemed to have patches of missing flesh or skin. His description alluded to some sort of nightmarish bipedal jackal. As soon as the entity stepped into the glare of the headlights, its eyes glowed an ominous orange as it fixed its gaze directly at Raymond. Promptly, it started advancing towards his truck. Now, simultaneously, additional creatures materialized from the vegetation on the opposite side of the road, also converging on his vehicle. Being quick on his feet, Raymond realized he lacked the time to properly combat them. In his desperation, he instantly shifted his vehicle into drive and veered past the creature with a swift maneuver. The sudden action induced his tires to squeal and rubber to burn in a fashion reminiscent of a scene from a movie. 
These actions gave a looming feel to Raymond's urgent drive to evade the menacing creatures threatening him at every side. Once Raymond whizzed past the mysterious thing, around four or five of these beings initiated a ruthless pursuit towards his vehicle. In a surprising turn of events, one managed to actually leap and land in the bed of his vehicle, investing its energy into breaking the rear window. In a desperate attempt to shuffle off the beast, Raymond performed a dangerous sway on the thoroughfare, nearly capsizing his conveyance, yet succeeding in flinging the creature out onto the road. One other nearly approached his passenger side door, executing a string of unsuccessful attempts to infiltrate. This high-stakes, spine-chilling encounter lingered for around two or three exhaustive minutes before the being seemingly dissipated. Returning home, Raymond scrutinized his car meticulously. However, to his bewilderment, he found no marks of scratches or any other indications aligning with the unexplained events that had undergone. Even though he is left without an explanation of these strange occurrences, one thing that Raymond is certain about is his newfound dread of driving at night in Texas. The entities, or what it was, remains a mystery to him. Let me know your comments down below as to what you think this was. I grew up in a small town called Alpine, situated in Brewster County. Throughout my years, I've heard plenty of strange tales about things that go bump in the desert night. You know, like Chupacabra, for example. Well, moving forward just a few years, I actually moved out of Alpine and made my home in San Antonio. Now let me tell you, there's something about the city life. Maybe it's the energy, maybe it's the hustle, but every so often, I just get a hankering for the sweet quiet of small town life. So I head back to Alpine to escape the city grind and see some old friends of mine. Now, this particular time, I had gone around Christmas time, and I found myself around a fire pit with one of my best childhood friends, Jack. We were having ourselves a good old time, just, you know, reminiscing about old adventures and joking around with such abandon as you can only do with someone who's known you since your diaper days. Now, out of nowhere, Jack, whose face had turned grave, began telling me about a very strange experience he had recently. He spoke of nightmares he'd been having about a certain entity, not something easily identifiable like a mountain lion or maybe a coyote, but something much more alien, something that had deeply disturbed him. Now, he described it as a twisted version of a man with long, gnarly fingers and a face that was more beast than human. Him retelling the account turned my blood to ice. But see, his encounter didn't just stop at the nightmares. This entity didn't just exist within the dream realm only, because just a few weeks back, late one evening, he was actually startled awake by the sound of slow, creaking footsteps just outside his house. Gathering his wits about him, he slowly made his way to the window and pulled the blinds aside. And right there, the same disturbing entity from his dreams was right there in his back porch, rooted to the ground, not by fear or shock, but by a frozen horror that consumed him while he stared at this thing. All Jack could really do was just pray, and it eventually went away. Now, he had actually talked to a local friend of his who owns a ranch who is of Comanche descent. Now, I know that Comanches have their share of tribal folklore, and what happened next basically made their heads spin. His friend suggested that this creature he's speaking of bears resemblance to a monstrous entity, what's known to many as a skinwalker. Tales of such beings who are not quite human, not quite beast, have been passed down through many generations. Now that conversation alone with Jack shook me, I'll admit. It planted a seed of unease within me that kept growing, even during the nighttime. Despite my dose of reality every day in the concrete jungles of San Antonio, suddenly the world just contained a darker undercurrent for me. Now a few months after, I got a chance to visit Alpine again. This was probably around April or May. Jack and I were headed home from an evening at a local pub when we went on a deserted stretch of road. Now, wouldn't you know it, his truck's high beams picked out a figure ahead. From the distance, we both remarked how large of a dog that was, 
but as we neared, something felt amiss. It did not move like any canine I've ever known in my life. And then it turned to face us. And what I saw made my heart nearly pound out of my chest. It had human-like features and that same twisted, gnarled form that Jack had once told me about. I yanked the wheel around and practically flew the other direction. This was something unbelievable by both of us. Had we just seen the same thing? It was very real, and I knew it. There's a lot of stuff that goes bump in the night out here in Texas. I mean, after all, if you've ever driven through the state, there's just a lot of nothing around. As for what Jack and I saw, we just don't talk about it. Following the initial account, another chilling encounter was revealed by a woman named Shelly B, and she disclosed her terrifying experience in Texas to Fordian researcher Nick Redfern. On a particularly notable occasion in June 2009, an unusual event would take place. Shelly was navigating her way along the OK9E route, a road that links the towns of Norman and Tecumseh in Oklahoma, when the extraordinary unfolded. Suddenly, emerging from the tree line to her right, appeared a creature that bore an uncanny resemblance to what is commonly referred to as the Texas Chupacabra. This is to say a lean, hairless entity with a strange gray-bluish shade, an outright oddity completely different from the usual. For those that are unaware, the Texas Chupacabra is generally understood to be a coyote afflicted with several bizarre mutations. Shelley's encounter, however, veered off this common interpretation, leading down a decidedly more peculiar trajectory. At approximately 10 in the morning, when Shelley had her sighting, she reported that the road was mostly peaceful. The bustle of school runs had ended, and the majority of people were occupied at their workplaces. Strangely yet enticingly, when she decelerated on the Oklahoma 9 East Road, she was startled by the spectacle of a creature which stood roughly 60 feet away from her towards the right. An abrupt, ominous sensation of solitude engulfed her, akin to being in a vacuum or a situation that seemed out of place. Shelley reported that, for about a minute if not more, the creature maintained a keen gaze at her, ensuing goosebumps and a clear sentiment that it endeavored to establish some communication. It was as if her conscience could perceive it beyond merely spotting it on the road. However, the scenario escalated to a bizarre extent immediately afterward. Nonchalantly, the creature ambled across the road, whereupon something astonishing transpired. It began to flicker and become fuzzy. Briefly, it mimicked the clumsy form of a small-sized bear, then morphed into the guise of a lustrous black feline and eventually returned to its initial format, a Texas chupacabra. Considering that this experience transpired at the peak of a sweltering summer morning, it was queried whether what seemed to be a mutation of the animal's physical form could have actually been the result of a shimmering, sizzling heat wave on the roadway ahead. Shelley was unequivocally certain that this was not the reason. She fervently declared that the creature she observed literally and momentarily metamorphosed. Although, to be precise, she abstained from employing such an emotion-charged and provocative phrase as shapeshifted. Astounding by the unfolding situation, Shelley merely sat transfixed as the creature sauntered into the woods on the opposite side of the highway and vanished, never to be seen again. But that wasn't the string of strange incidents. Upon driving away, somewhat uneasily, Shelley switched on the radio. And coincidentally, the song playing was Werewolves of London by Warren Zevon. It's no secret that werewolves are known for their shape-shifting abilities, and strangeness continue to follow her. So get this. Call this a synchronicity, if you will. Later in that day, she received a call from an old friend who was in the midst of relocating to Oregon and was exploring the area for potential housing. Mysteriously enough, Mandy, the person she was speaking to, brought up that a large black panther had been spotted in Deschutes County, the very area she was moving to. Shelley found all these coincidences incredibly weird. So, is there any correlation at all, or just a mere coincidence? The captivating phenomenon of shapeshifters 
often referred to as werewolves or dogmen, holds a long-standing presence in Texas, gosh, dating back centuries, this captivating subject seeps deeply within the pages of Texan history, demonstrated by numerous accounts akin to those previously divulged. In fact, back in 1845, near the Devil's River, close to the Del Rio, southwestern Texas, an eerie tale originated from the San Felipe Springs. An adolescent boy had reported sightings of huge wolves and an uncanny creature obscured by a mantle of long hair, which bore a striking resemblance to a little girl. This strange entity was seen attacking a herd of goats. This unusual sight instilled fear among the locals at the time, who promptly embarked on a hunt for the supposed predators. Now, by the third day, the mystery girl was spotted, this time coexisting with a pack of wolves in a canyon. During the encounter, one of the wolves who attacked the hunters was shot. The girl was seized and taken to a proximate ranch where she was confined in seemingly foolproof rooms. As the sun gave way to the moon's rain, this strange story took a much more sinister turn. An aggressive wolf pack slowly closed in on the ranch, encircling it completely. The ensuing mayhem frightened the farm animals. Chaos reigned as the wolves launched their attack, resulting in the escape of the girl. She successfully eluded them for the next seven years. In 1852, fortune favored a surveying crew seeking a new route to El Paso. They spotted her on a sandbank adjacent to the Rio Grande. She was accompanied by a couple of wolf cubs. Before they could approach her, she vanished, all without a trace, concluding the tale with her disappearance forever. So, was she a feral child? fostered by wolves' raw wilderness? Could she have been a quintessential lycanthrope with the ability to shapeshift? Or perhaps she was an anomaly of a different sort? The Wheel of Time has irrefutably perpetuated the enigma of the Devil's River Wolf Girl, rendering it a timeless, unsolved mystery. In the June 2, 1888 edition of the Dallas Morning News, an intriguing tale entitled A Huge Wolf Killed Big as a Yearling was chronicled. The news item described how Frank Beshore, a local farmer living on the outskirts of the city, hunted down and killed an unusually massive gray wolf, which he subsequently brought into the town. The creature was said to be nearly the size of a yearling calf, making it one of the largest of its kind to ever be killed in these parts. Such animals were reportedly causing significant hardship within the small community. One man alleging damages worth of at least $1,000 caused to his sheep by the wolves. Now remember folks, this was back pre-1900, so a thousand bucks back then, well, you do the math, it was quite a bit. Could it possibly be that some sightings and reports of werewolves were actually based on encounters with real, oh, I don't know, extraordinary large wolves? Now, this theory might actually hold some merit. In her book, Hunting the American Werewolf, Linda Godfrey, rest in peace, proposed the idea that some of the unidentified creatures rumored to be werewolves in the forest and woods of the U.S. could, in fact, be surviving descendants of the beast known collectively as Amphicyonidae, or dogs of doubtful origin. Now, this intriguing theory highlights the potential for misinterpretations and misunderstanding in local folklore. This deadly and substantial creature presents an uncanny blend of a robust bear and a powerful dog. Roaming the planet during the Miocene era, around 23 to 5 million years ago, this creature has since fallen into extinction, or better yet, believed to have become extinct. The headline, Hunt for Phantom-like Animal, was prominently featured in the January 29, 1908 edition of the Dallas Morning News, according to that publication. The article suggested that a large beast, alternatively described as a giant dog or wolf, was causing widespread chaos, death, and destruction in Waco. Having been on a rampage for an entire month, livestock from pigs, dogs, and ducks to geese and hens were victimized, resulting not only in their slaughter, but also in their consumption. Moreover, the beast was speculated to be nearly spectral-like in its existence. The Dallas Morning News reported that spectators of the lupine-like creature characterized it as a phantom that navigated the area. 
effortlessly leaping over fences from one plot to the next, both elusive and nebulous, bearing the moments when its teeth and claws were actively employed. Now, the newspaper included a statement from the McLennan County Fox Hunters Association. Their most seasoned hunters confessed that, although they have successfully captured large wolves, red and gray foxes, bobcats, catamounts, they are perplexed by the identification of this strange creature. Regardless of what it turned out to be, it vanished as enigmatically into the night, dominated by the moonlight as it had initially emerged. Without a doubt, one of the most fascinating accounts came from Mrs. Delbert Gregg, a resident of the eastern Texas town of Gregton, situated near Longview. On a fittingly dark and stormy night in July of 1958, a strange scratching sound at the screen window of her bedroom awakened her. Now, for a brief moment, she was left in a state of confusion. That was until an abrupt, brilliant flash of lightning illuminated the room, unveiling the horrifying sight of a gigantic, unkempt wolf-like creature to a terrified Mrs. Gregg. The creature peered at her from behind the screen. Its eyes were malevolent, radiating, and slitted. As Mrs. Gregg leapt out of bed unnerved, hastened to retrieve a light, the creature swiftly made its way into the concealment of adjacent shrubbery. From that point on, it was never seen again. The tale of the Wolfman from Converse Town remains an enthralling mystery even today. As per lore, during the 1960s, a creature reminiscent of a classic werewolf savagely murdered a young boy at the ominous location, Skull's Crossing. The anecdote reveals that the boy's father had sent him on his maiden, and as destiny would cruelly decree, his ultimate hunting venture. Ironically, the boy who should have played the hunter's role became the prey. While he ventured into a thick forested area, he unexpectedly found himself being hunted by this creature, prompting him to desperately run back home. However, his father simply chuckled at his son's supposed exaggeration, instructing him to return into the forest to claim his first quarry. This exchange marked their final conversation, subsequent to the boy's failure to return home that evening, a resolute search party was dispatched. Their findings took a horrific turn as they discovered an unbelievable sight. A massive, werewolf-like creature was spotted, grotesquely feasting on the boy's motionless form. As is widely accepted, the story undoubtedly stirs controversy. Several investigators lean towards classifying it as part folklore, possibly rumors, or tales akin to, you know, I had a friend of a friend of a friend, you know, that sort of thing. The thing narrated around a campfire deep into the night. But despite this, the grim legend of the Converse werewolf continues to flourish amidst the town's residents, even up to this very day. So let me take you back to a cool, startlit night in November of a few years ago. I was coming off a double shift at work, driving my old beater of a pickup along the back roads that snake through Bastrop County. Now, if you've ever driven these parts, you will know the road near the Lost Pines. It's narrow, winding, and ill-lit, surrounded on all sides by thick forest. You're more likely to see an armadillo or a deer on the road than another vehicle. That's the kind of isolated stretch we're talking about here. So I was there blaring the radio, do you know, just some old country tunes, and the night sky above me scattered with thousands of stars. Instantly, the radio cut out, like it lost signal or maybe something had interrupted it. As I glanced at the dashboard, trying to figure out what was going on, I saw something creeping along the edge of the road beyond the glow of my headlights. I tapped on my brakes, squinting. It was then that the truck's headlights illuminated this thing. This was not just some coyote or a stray dog. This critter was twisted and unnatural, the kind of thing that just makes you squirm thinking about. I mean, I've been around wildlife all my life, especially here in Texas, but I couldn't explain what I was looking at. It reminded me of a warped version of a human crossed with, I don't know, some wild animal. It was hunched over with a shaggy pelt and had ferocious yellow eyes. It even gleamed in the headlights. The image of its face is forever scorched into my memory. The twisted, malformed, just plain wrong. I'd heard people down at the local watering hole talking about things like this at night. 
you know, just mythical creatures of Native American lore, but I was never sure that this stuff even existed. I was able to shake it off and put my foot on the accelerator because I knew I had to get away quick. I had no idea if this thing was capable of attacking me or what on earth it was doing. I won't forget that night because I remember driving to a diner on the outskirts of Austin and just drinking multiple cups of black coffee, just trying to rid myself of that memory. Now, my encounter with that thing didn't end there because for some reason, it seemed to have taken a liking to me, like I had been marked or spotted or something because I would see it several more times often near the exact same stretch of road where I had my first sighting. And it was always right along the road, just the shadowy edge. But I'm tired of seeing it, I do not want to see it anymore. Every so often, a tale emerges that is just so bizarre, it becomes exceedingly hard to make sense of it, especially when the witness appears to be highly credible, clear-minded, and is not seeking extensive publicity or really any publicity at all. One such instance from the records dates back to the early 2000s. Even 14 years after the witness was interviewed, his tale continues to stick in his mind. Back in 2003, an interview was conducted with a man named Solomon, who was then in his mid 80s. He shared a very surreal tale about an encounter he had with a shape-shifting entity around 70 years prior tracing back to when he was a young teen. The episode took place in a thick woodland located in Orange, Texas. It was during a routine Sunday morning, and Solomon and his friends decided to embark on an explorative adventure in the woods. They enjoyed their excursion for a couple of hours before finding a spot to sit and indulge in the lunches that they had carried along with them. Everything was going smoothly, until one member of the group felt a chilling sensation, which most of them experience occasionally. The unsettling feeling of being closely observed specifically. Soon enough, the others felt it as well, almost simultaneously. They turned their gaze across the small rivulet standing there before them. What they saw was beyond their wildest imaginations. A large wolf-like head emerging from the thick vegetation fixated right at them, as if they were just innocent prey waiting to be devoured. Upon realizing its discovery, this creature abruptly shattered the undergrowth, lurkily stalking along the water's edge. The quartet of boys could not help but question if they were being evaluated as the creature's impending meal. The unveiling of its terrifying presence left them aghast. This beast, resembling a wolf, stretched to a daunting 10 feet and displayed an incredibly muscular physique, exceeding by far any normal wolf's specifications. Time and time again, the monstrosity paused, directing chilling, deep, guttering growls towards them while maintaining a steady, daunting gaze. Understandably, the fear-stricken boys could not summon the bravado to move. However, in the midst of their terror, something extremely odd and unexpected happened. The enormous wolf-like being abruptly settled down, initiating a motion that Solomon identified as a shake. To further intrigue, it was instantly engulfed by a cryptic green mist. As a result, the creature underwent an alarming transformation. Its rear legs notably altered in shape, enabling it to rear up onto them and tower over the panic-stricken boys at an astounding height of around 10 feet. The being's front limbs took an unmistakably human-like characteristic, although masked in dense fur. After menacingly snapping and growling at the adolescents from its position across the brook for a few moments, the beast turned around and vanished, never to be seen. The boys predictably evacuated the area immediately. This was not the only supernatural experience that young Solomon ever had, and he was more than content to leave it at that. Another story, again, shared by Nick Redfern, details more strange creatures like this one throughout Texas. You see, a couple referred to here in this story as Don and Vanessa had found themselves driving from Denton to Huffman, Texas to visit friends. Interestingly enough, Huffman was the scene of a notorious UFO incident back in December of 1980. 
It was during this incident, three individuals, Betty Cash, Vicki Landrum, and Colby Landrum, claim to have had an unnerving encounter with what some speculate to be a UFO, or perhaps a top secret military craft. It's crucial to note that the presence of two events in Huffman doesn't naturally indicate a connection. However, it's been widely observed that when strange entities or sightings, UFO encounters usually aren't far behind and vice versa. With that in mind, the couple's tale unfolds as follows. While driving through a wooded stretch of road late on a Thursday evening, Don and Vanessa were alarmed to see an extremely strange man crossing the road in their path. Based on the couple's description, there is absolutely no idea of what or who it may have been. Indeed, if we reject the hypothesis of a hoax, which seems unlikely given the extensive conversations held with this couple and the aspect of a prank, although not impossible but improbable, then one could say that the couple had a near face-to-face -face encounter with an ingeniously bizarre entity. Whether this was a creature from an entirely different world or a being from a strange realm or dimension beyond our understanding, it remains indeterminable. However, it can be stated fairly that this entity was not a local. Given that the couple wasn't too sure about their path, it posed no difficulty evading the entity, whomever it was. As they approached within roughly 40 feet, both the husband and wife concluded that this was not a man at all. This entity was indeed an uncanny and chilling spectacle of the most strangest proportions. Foremost was its towering stature, measuring approximately eight feet. Equally striking was its entirely black hue. This was not the typical raven black of fur or hair, but rather an alarming obscurity of the skin. The creature possessed an unnaturally massive belly outsized to the rest of its form. Meanwhile, the head seemingly sunken into the shoulder width was markedly characterized by a large pointed nose reminiscent of a witch. However, an even more extraordinary attribute distinguished this creature, its bizarre mode of locomotion. As per the description, each step resembled a laborious attempt at wading out of a dense quagmire. With its legs lifted high and stepping with methodical precision, its strange footfall was agonizingly slow, yet deliberate. The reason for this atypical gait was even more strange its feet pointed in reverse. They understand that at this juncture, the story could easily be dismissed as far-fetched. However, they can't ignore the fact that there are a plethora of indigenous creatures globally that carry forward old folklores about fantastic monsters with backward-facing feet. The unfortunate pair observed in a state of awe tinged with terror as the creature traversed the road in its unusual gait disappearing into the arbor without a halt or even a sideways glance in their direction. Does one entertain the notion of an overweight Bigfoot plagued by mange and an odd foot ailment running rampant at Kaufman? Most definitely not. What is believed instead is that Don and Vanessa experienced a fleeting encounter with one of those strange entities that captivated John Keel. Those nocturnal beasts that momentarily appear into our reality then hastily disappear again leaving nothing but baffled and horrified onlookers in their wake. What do you think? I've been living in Texas for more than 30 years now, currently residing in a small town just outside of Waco. The place is known for its historical vibes and seemingly untouched by the mainstream way of life. It has an air of mystery that hangs in every corner and nook. Now, this incident that I'm sharing happened a few months back in the thick of an oppressively hot summer, the kind of heat that makes your skin feel stretched tightly over your bones and muscles. One evening, I took a solo drive out to Proctor Lake, about 60 miles southwest of my location. It's one of those forgotten places where time stands still, the sort of place where things out of the ordinary can feel, well, ordinary. I rode out in my old pickup truck, winding down the desolate FM 1476, a road flanked by open fields and an occasional thicket of Texan trees. The sun was low, and by the time I got there, it was already about dark. So I parked along the edge of the lake, 
I reclined my seat and just relished in the warmth of the setting sun or nearly setted sun. It was peaceful, quiet, and all of a sudden, that all was ruptured. The sounds of nature, everything, halted, as if leaving a blanket of silence behind so thick you could almost feel it weighing down on you. Out of nowhere, this feeling of fear seized me. Not the usual nervous flutterings of unease, but a raw terror that was churning in the pit of my stomach. My gaze was then drawn across the road toward a hulking figure emerging from the tree-lined edge of the narrow country path leading down to the water's edge. I first assumed it was a stray cow, but as my eyes adjusted to the dim light, the form took on an altogether more chilling character. It was about the size of a fully grown buck, but it had a strange, unnatural gait, as if it were moving on all fours while upright. The creature had a dog-like aspect, but the features seemed grotesquely distorted. The spine was arched, and it had an alarming mass of matted fur running down its length. Its eyes reflected an eerie glowing white. After what felt like an eternal moment, but was probably only a minute or two, it lowered its gaze and loped off, its silhouette fading into the darkness beyond the reach of my headlights. I waited there for a while, trapped between the urge to chase after it and the overwhelmingly sensible desire to escape. Well, ladies and gentlemen, fear one. I hit the gas, leaving this place far behind. Months afterwards, I returned once in the evening, replaying that encounter in my head over and over and over. Fortunately, I've never seen it again, and I still enjoy visiting this lake for some calm and peace. Unfortunately, I have no answers about what I saw that night. Alright guys, because you made it here, I want you to all comment down below, let's go to Texas. So I know who made it to the end of the video. And more importantly, I want to know what you all think. And don't forget to slap that like and subscribe button if you guys enjoyed this one. As always, I love you all, keep an open mind, and I'll catch you all in the very next episode.